So let's get started. First of all, just thank you all for coming. Uh, I know the free lunch probably had something to do with it, but uh, we're flattered to think that maybe the book had also something to do with it. And I really want to thank uh, all the terrific people at the library who make this series go. It's really been a wonderful addition to our community to have a chance to have uh, uh, to see what kinds of interesting work is being done by our faculty and to have a, an opportunity to discuss it with our whole community. And I see uh, many colleagues here and uh, many students uh, from both the JD and the graduate program as well as members of our community more generally. So we're thrilled to be here. Uh, my name is David Wilkins. For those of you who don't know, I'm a professor here at the law school. I'm also the faculty director of the Center on the Legal Profession. Uh, and I've been interested really throughout my career uh, in issues of diversity in the legal profession. I came here in 1986, uh, so that means I'm old and I've been here a long time. And, and really beginning in the 1980s was when there began to be attention to these issues. Uh, first around issues of gender and then more broadly around issues of race. And one of the questions that maybe we'll have a chance to discuss at the end here is, you know, what is the meaning of diversity here? And, and how do we think about that in today's increasingly global context? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What, I, what we thought we would do here uh, is to give you a little bit of a sense of, first, why we wrote the book and why we assembled the kinds of scholars that we did in the book. Uh, second, a little bit about the big themes of the book that we think come out from the various empirical studies. Uh, third, to give you a, just a little taste of what some of the empirical work looks like and maybe why we think it might be valuable. Uh, fourth, and most importantly, to get some commentary from somebody coming from outside of law, but who is, as I will say in a second, uh, one of the most distinguished uh, scholars working in this field today, uh, both about the book, but also how he sees it fitting into a broader context of work on diversity and discrimination generally. And then we absolutely want to uh, leave time to hear from you. Uh, so we will absolutely leave time for questions and answers. And the one thing that the great folks at the library have asked me to remind you is that this is being filmed. So if you do ask a question, you will be, uh, one, asked to speak to the microphone so we can really capture it. And second, that you'll be a part of this film, which I don't think will win any Academy Awards, but will go up on the law school and the center on the legal profession's website. So, uh, the first part uh, I'm going to do, which is to say a little bit about why we wrote this kind of a book or brought together these kinds of scholars, uh, then my collaborator and really fearless leader, as I will say, uh, Robert Nelson, who's a professor of sociology and of law at Northwestern University and has just stepped down from being the director of the American Bar Foundation, which really was the key linchpin in putting this group together, which he'll talk about and is, without question, I think, the leading uh, sociologist of the legal profession of his generation. Uh, then I'll come back and talk a little bit about my contribution, uh, my particular empirical study contribution to this volume and show you a little bit of data. And then finally, we are just absolutely thrilled that Frank Dobbin, who some of you may know, uh, but more of you should know, is really the most interesting and influential empirical researcher uh, doing work on discrimination. He's a professor in the sociology department. He's written a number of path-breaking books in this area. And he just told me that his uh, most recent project is going to be looking particularly at uh, various interventions in the diversity area and trying to understand what has worked and what hasn't worked, which I can't imagine a more important project than that. Uh, and then we'll open it up for questions. So, on the first point, why this book and why this approach? Um, there's been a lot of discussion around diversity. Uh, and, you know, we know this particularly uh, right here on our campus, but more generally, diversity in the legal profession has been a very important topic for a number of years. But to be honest, uh, there has been very little systematic empirical work around that discussion about what the 
real causes of the problem are, uh, about how to think about various interventions, and as I said, Frank is looking at whether they have worked or haven't worked, um, what accounts for differences in various kinds of organizations around the question of diversity and different kinds of diversity, whether we're talking gender, whether we're talking race, whether we're talking other forms of diversity. So uh, Bob Nelson came to me, now this is how many years ago? Four years ago, something like that, and said, you know, I want to have uh, getting the best empirical research around these issues is one of the centerpieces of my time as the director of the American Bar Foundation. And so that was our goal, and we held a series of conferences, we invited scholars, as you will see if you look at the book, from lots of different uh, per, uh, academic backgrounds. So we have business school scholars, we have sociologists, we have law professors, we have people who are in, uh, whose basic background is in organizational behavior, some whose background is in marketing, to try to get what we uh, could determine was the most interesting empirical work around important questions in the area of diversity. Um, we hope that we have accomplished that, and uh, the book, which I hope you'll have a chance to take a look at, it's just literally out this week, but they're taking orders for it from the back, it's not cheap, we don't get rich from it, that's the way academic work books work, but we hope it'll be a good resource for people, uh, both professionals, students, and academics interested in these questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Robert Nelson. Thank you, David, and thank you all for coming, uh, coming today. Um, and first of all, I just want to thank David uh, not only for putting this event together, but also for being a co-director of the research group on legal diversity. Um, David's work has been uh, extremely important to this field of inquiry. Uh, and uh, starting with the early work that he did with Mitu Galati back in the 90s uh, up through today, and the current project that he's doing on globalization and law in emerging economies and the influence of that on uh, diversity issues is extremely uh, important and extremely valuable. Uh, and also, it's just great to have Frank Dobbin here. Frank, as, as David said, is one of the leading uh, sociologists looking at organizations, the intersection of organizations and discrimination and organizational responses to discrimination. Uh, his book on uh, discrimination, the the invention of uh, uh, EEO uh, won the best book prize from the American Sociological Association uh, last year. So we have uh, a real start with us today. So Frank, thanks for joining us. So my career, I'm um, a, a JD PhD who has been working as a sociologist, uh, spent my career at the American Bar Foundation the last 11 years, uh, I have been the director of the American Bar Foundation. Uh, my work has focused on two broad areas. One is the legal profession and the social organization of the legal profession. Uh, but within that, a real focus on uh, inequality and mobility within the legal profession. And then the other area is the uh, field of anti-discrimination law. Uh, and in both of those fields, looking at the relationship between law and inequality, the big question is, what impact does law have on inequality? you know, through discrimination, anti-discrimination law. Uh, but then, in turn, what is the impact of inequality on law? Uh, and the research group on legal diversity is a group of 50 scholars who we brought together from around the country. We've had uh, several conferences. We had three conferences. Uh, this book actually arose from the third conference that, that we held. Uh, and we have a new, another conference uh, the next month on metrics, diversity, and law, which will look at the impact on, of metrics uh, in, this, uh, in this field. So the idea has been to put together a group of scholars who are specialists in uh, law and social science uh, to look at these issues. Uh, and it draws not only from legal scholars, but as David was mentioning, people from uh, business schools and from the social sciences more generally. Uh, as a way to enrich our understanding within law and the legal profession about broader dynamics that are affecting the law, but then also to 
look at the impact of law on those broader dynamics concerning uh, inequality. Uh, so this, this book um, does range beyond a sort of typical legal professions book, uh, both in the sense that we're, we go beyond the United States as subject matter, and there are a series of chapters that deal with the United Kingdom as a comparison case. But then also we go outside the legal profession. Uh, some of the chapters have explicit comparisons between different kinds of professional service organizations uh, and law. Uh, one has to do with uh, commitments to diversity in corporate boardrooms. And so looking at corporate boards, uh, what, is the, what has been the fate of diversity uh, in, that, uh, in that environment? But then we have a series of, of uh, articles and chapters that are uh, focused on particular context within uh, the legal profession uh, using some very creative uh, methods and I want to talk a little bit about uh, about those specific projects uh, in, in just a minute. I think I want to, in a way I want to pose sort of two big questions or two big themes that this book uh, addresses. Now the book is entitled Diversity in Practice. Uh, there is no doubt that there is a huge rhetorical commitment to diversity in the legal profession and in other aspects of corporate America. Uh, so one question that I think arises is, why do we see that? Why do we see that kind of rhetoric, at least? Is it sincere? Is it genuine? Uh, is it just window dressing to sort of pace over uh, problems of, of inequality? Uh, and several of the chapters in this book wrestle with that issue. Um, David's chapter, which looks at the call to action, which was a famous um, call to action by a general counsel, uh, Roderick Palmar, um, really asking law firms, outside law firms who were serving corporate clients to take seriously the challenge of uh, increasing diversity within their law firms and also in the practice teams that actually represented those corporate clients. Now the, the finding uh, that, uh, that we have, and then, and then David's chapter follows that up with a, uh, a very unusual and innovative study of how corporate counsel actually choose their outside law firms. And look at, looks at the importance of diversity in those judgments, in those considerations. And basically it finds that diversity is kind of a middling level criteria. You know, much more important is still the issue of trust, quality of work, the sort of old-fashioned uh, sort of relationships between corporate counsel and law firms. Uh, and so the, the, you know, the chapter kind of ends with the question, well, where are we going to go in the future? Uh, corporations continue to put pressure on outside firms to increase their diversity. And yet if you look at the data on where we are in terms of, uh, of diversity, we have more or less stalled uh, since uh, the early 2000s. In terms of the percentage of women and minorities who are making partner in large corporate law firms, it's more or less stalled. For, for women, about 17% of partners in law firms are, are women. Uh, minorities of different groups are in the 3 and 4% range. And there is some other interesting work inside this book that talks about the configuration of those patterns, looks at, at variation. It, it turns out to, to be the case that larger law firms uh, firms with more global reach, with larger numbers of, of offices, uh, have uh, more diverse uh, workforces. But it, it is still pretty much the case that we have not made very much progress beyond the early progress that, that we made leading up to the early 2000s. The other major theme that I want to talk about is this, this notion of persistent inequality that in a variety of different areas we see, despite the, despite the rhetoric about making progress, uh, we see various barriers to advancement by traditionally disadvantaged groups. Uh, it's fascinating to have uh, a set of essays from uh, a set of scholars from the UK, the UK uh, professional service firms, both consultancies and the solicitors firms, have talked openly about there being a, a lack of talent. And so the war for talent, the phrase that is used is that there is a war for talent. Uh, but what the authors discover when they actually probe that 
is that they're looking for a certain kind of credential talent. So there's an enormous amount of residual class bias that operates so that only people with certain select educational uh, credentials are considered to have the right kind of talent. Um, and that very much echoes um, some work that has just been published uh, by Laura Rivera, who's a graduate of Frank's department, um, called Pedigree. It's a very important book uh, looking at the hiring practices of elite professional firms in the United States, comparing, it's, it's not a comparison, but it includes uh, consulting firms, investment banks, and law <coughs> firms. And basically, Rivera makes the same, same kind of argument that the search for talent is enormously biased in favor of certain class backgrounds. And so without the kind of cultural and social capital that you develop from those backgrounds, you won't have much of a chance in the tournament for hiring uh, in those elite professional firms. But not only that, the way talent is constructed, socially constructed in those firms uh, means that that also is going to operate to uh, guarantee those barriers will continue. So I want to just comment on the, the, the research that has been done by the research group is of several different types. It includes cross-national comparisons of a quantitative nature. It includes comparative work. It includes large-scale survey analyses. It includes ethnographic work. Uh, and much of those, the, many of those methodologies show up inside this book. There are two chapters I want to just call out as being, I think, especially interesting. One is uh, a chapter by uh, Bis Briscoe and Van Nordenflicht, which looks, it's a case study of a law firm, uh, and it looks at whether or not, what are the, uh, what is the best route to achieving sort of rainmaking status, the sort of highly prestigious, highly remunerative positions inside law firms. And basically what they discover is that it's a different path for white males compared to minority men and women. For white men, uh, the most common path is succession, basically the inheritance of clients. For women and minorities, they have to make their own book of business. They have to go outside the existing book of business and establish new client relationships. That's the way they will achieve partnership and achieve the sort of higher levels of earnings and power within those firms. Um, it's very rare to get these kinds of case studies in which you actually look at the source of lawyers' work inside an organization, uh, but it's enormously valuable when we, when we get, to, uh, get to that. The other is a, is a piece by a writer and uh, Chris Ryder and uh, a set of colleagues that looks at what happens to the lawyers who were working at six big law firms that went bust in the 2000s and looked at what happened to the, the, the white men, women, and minorities that all lost their jobs. And you can look and see what happens then in terms of how the market shakes out uh, for, those, for those jobs. And what, he, what, he, what they find is that uh, white men were much more likely to gain partnerships and partnerships in more lucrative organizations than was the case for uh, women and minorities. The, the explanation they offer is that the peer groups, the peer relationships of those social groups differ, and that explains why the, the white men achieve much more success in the marketplace after the collapse of those, those law firms. So I think that gives you a flavor um, of what we have in this volume. Uh, this is obviously ongoing work. Uh, we are trying to uh, expand a whole field of inquiry. Uh, we have a lot of assumptions about how this world uh, operates that are not often tested empirically. And so uh, we see this as an ongoing effort. It's an important step. And uh, I appreciate you guys for coming and uh, look forward to your comments and questions. So what I thought I would just do is give you a little flavor of the kind of empirical work that we're doing by showing you a little bit about the chapter that Bob just uh, talked about. Um, this call to action, which many of you may have heard of, and if you haven't heard of it by 
you know, by its name, you know that there's been increasing pressure by consumers, here in this case, corporate clients, to put pressure on their suppliers, in this case, law firms, to be more diverse. I call these demand side diversity initiatives. I wrote about this uh, 15 years ago that you know, you're trying to produce uh, a change over here by changing the demand for minority and women lawyers. And in 2004, uh, Rick Palmore, who was one of the few black general counsels of a Fortune 500 company at that time, issued what he called the call to action, asking general counsels to commit their companies, quote, to make decisions regarding which law firms to represent our companies based in significant part on the diversity performance of the firms. Now, by one definition, it's been incredibly successful. More than 150 top companies, and I'm talking all the big ones you would know, have signed it, and many of their general counsels have made statements that diversity for us is one of the most important criteria in legal hiring. And they backed it up by requiring that law firms uh, uh, make detailed reporting about how many women and minorities they have, how many have been hired lately, how many people are working on our matters. There's a whole complex reporting structure. Well, we wanted to see how that might correspond to what might be going on in reality. But I want to be clear, we have a very kind of interesting and somewhat circuitous way of asking that question. Because it turned out that we were doing another project uh, that actually was not specifically about diversity at all. It was a survey project and an interview project about how corporations purchase legal services in, quote, very significant matters. That's neither commodity work, where we know it's all driven by price, but it's not what sometimes people refer to as bet the company cases either, the most extraordinary event that the company's ever had. Actually, I tell general counsels and I speak to a lot of them, you know, you should actually not use the phrase bet the company because if you do it more than once, you should be fired. Um, <laughs> so I'm talking about the kind of important work that most big law firms do and want to do, okay? And we ran this project between 2006 and 2007. We ran a bunch of focus groups. We interviewed a bunch of general counsels and big consumers of legal uh, services. We did a survey of the S&P 500 in which we got a pretty high response rate for a survey. And then we did a pretty rigorous non-respondent analysis which shows our survey is actually pretty representative. And we correlated this with other data that we could find about the companies that responded. And Here's basically what we found, right? Oh, I'm sorry. And the goal of the project was to test the wisdom of an argument that had been going on about whether law was moving from a, quote, relational model, in which law was what the economists would call a credence good, which is you buy it on the, ba on the basis of your relationships with people, not on objective metrics because you don't really know what quality is, to something that looks more like a spot contracting model in which you just simply shop for the best producer and the best price. And that is exemplified by general counsel saying over and over again, we hire lawyers, not firms. If anybody's interested in that, I can talk more about that. But in the context, we ask people, how do you rate a series of factors when you're hiring law firms for important work? And this was what we got. If you look at this chart, you'll see a bunch of factors, which you might not be surprised as is being important. But look what dominates everything. Can you see my little pointer? Results in similar cases, reputation, prior relationship. These things are not only the only things that cross the line between being important, let alone very important. And everything else is kind of in this somewhat important to not important range. And look where, that's where commitment to diversity is. Now, let me just be clear, that's not nothing, okay? It's there with firm size, internal quality control systems, and it's bigger than like whether we have an office in Tajikistan, you know, or the thing that law firms obsess all about most of the time, which is their own financial performance, which many general counsel thinks is inversely correlated to who they <laughs> want to hire, okay? Um, but it's not the most important thing either. 
Now, why is it that we get this result as opposed to when, if you ask, when we interview general counsels and we said to them, how important is diversity? They said, oh my God, it's the most important thing. If they're not diverse enough, we kick them to the curb, we get rid of them. But of course, we know this can't be true because otherwise the numbers, which are, haven't budged much in the last 10 or 15 years or for blacks are actually declining, wouldn't be the way they are. We get this result because we didn't prime them to think about diversity. We primed them to think about something else, and then we got this result in diversity. Now, it wasn't even across all companies, right? That is, some companies claim to care about diversity more than others. And so we were interested in saying, well, what can we learn from that? And we had kind of four hypotheses. One is, is it a function of commitment? Meaning, the more committed you are and publicly committed to diversity, are you more likely then to actually internalize that by saying we rate diversity more highly? This is, by the way, the logic of signing a pledge, right? It's a commitment mechanism. Second, does we hear a lot about corporate America is way more diverse than law firms. Is if the company itself rates more highly on diversity metrics, is it more likely then to care more about diversity. Third, visibility. We sometimes hear that larger, more visible organizations, maybe more consumer-facing organizations, are more likely to show more interest in diversity because diversity is something that's very much in the popular domain today. Or if they've had a visible run-in around diversity, like a big, giant, a uh, class action employment discrimination case. Are they more likely to care about diversity? And finally, what we call external focus. Are they more likely to care about diversity if they are looking outward, benchmarking themselves against other companies as opposed to looking inward more? Now, let me be very clear about what we don't show here. We don't actually correlate what people say with what they've done. That's a different story, right? That, and that's a very worthwhile project. To my knowledge, there's very little empirical evidence about this. So this is, in some ways, a paper about talking about talk and when people talk in a certain way, depending upon who they think the audience is. So take that into consideration for what it's worth. Um, all right, commitment. So the first thing we asked is, if you sign the call to action, are you more likely to claim that you care about diversity more than if you didn't sign? And it turns out, and Rick Palmore, when I presented this to him, was very happy to hear, the answer is yes, that it's a statistically significant difference. But it's not a huge difference. And it turned out what was more important is if you belong to an organization called the Minority Corporate Council Association, then you can see MCCA members actually are much more likely than non-members to think that diversity or to say that diversity is important. We think the difference is to belong to the MCCA, A, costs money. You have to pay money to do it other, other than just signing your name, which is the call to action. And it comes with a bunch of programming and other support structures to try to reinforce people's commitment to diversity. So a little bit the takeaway here is commitment's nice, but the higher the commitment and the more it's reinforced with structure, the more likely at least it's going to respond, result in people raising the salience of the issue when they think about making legal purchasing decisions. Second, we wanted to look at demographics. And we first we're going to look at the demographics of general counsels about women and minorities. It turns out it's harder to collect that information, particularly around minorities. So an easier thing to collect was the gender of the, the highest named organizations and companies. As the corporate law people here know, you have to, do, you have to list publicly the, I think, 20 highest paid, most senior people in your company. And it's easy to tell which ones are women you know, with a 99% certainty by name. So we did that, OK? And then we correlated that with how likely people were to say uh, diversity was an important consideration. It turns out if you had 10% of women in your named executives, you got uh, a modest boost, right? Of kind of, you know, I shouldn't say modest, you were twice as likely to say that diversity was important. But if you had a lot of women, you were like, like 50%, which some of the companies in our sample did, you were 16 times more likely to say diversity was important 
relative to people where uh, the number of women was not greater than uh, uh, what was either zero or between zero and 10 percent. This has some support for what sometimes is called the, uh, um, now I've forgotten what you call the theory, where you, where you have enough people with critical mass. critical mass. Thank you very much. That's why I know everything I've ever learned I stole from Bob Nelson. Uh, the critical mass theory, right, that the larger the number, and we have similar data about women on boards, which correlates with this. And so again, happy to talk about this. Visibility. So one way to think about visibility is we have companies that are, we did the S&P 500, and some of the companies in the S&P are also in the Fortune 500. Those companies tend to be bigger, more consumer facing, more iconic names. You get more uh, closely held companies in the S&P 500. And we were actually surprised that if you look, at the, the reds are the S and P, the Fortune 500. The others are in blue. Much more likely to say diversity is important or very important than companies not in the S and P. I mean, not in the Fortune 500. Again, just a way maybe of some small evidence that the more visible the company is, the more that they're held to thinking about diversity. I think the finding in another paper that bigger law firms are more likely to be more diverse than smaller ones or bigger law schools, if we're sitting here, Harvard Law School is more diverse than many other law schools. Whether you're looking at students or faculty, this has something to do with it. Um, this one, sorry, it came out very badly, but this is about whether you've been sued for discrimination. So it turns out one of the biggest uh, promoters of uh, diversity in law firms and has one of the best supplier diversity initiatives is Walmart. <laughs> Walmart was subject to an enormous sex discrimination lawsuit. Sears is also very big. Um, we looked at whether you'd been sued recently for an important lawsuit which meant something that got visibility in the press. We have a metric if anybody's interested. And you could just see here that this lighter bar, which I'm now not getting at. These are the people who'd been sued. They're much more likely, particularly in this range, to say diversity is important or very important. Finally, law, law is a very insular project. Okay, so we asked general counsels. Remember, we have had them rate all those factors, you know, reputation, prior relation. We said, where did you get your information from when you were rating those factors? Here's what they told us. Most importantly, they asked the three smartest people the general counsel knows: <laughs> me, myself, and I. Okay. <laughs> Actually, the funny thing about this is this is only 97 percent, which is three percent of them are like Hamlet. They don't know this. Okay. <laughs> Not surprising. Okay. They used to be law firm partners. They, the next thing they did is they walked down the hall and they talked to their colleagues. But the thing that was surprising to me was that only 50 percent of them did anything else. And all, meaning, I asked anybody outside of their organization, and all those things like chambers and partners, you know, best looking male litigator of 2000, <laughs> they don't actually look those things very much. Okay? Now, but we have a big sample. So we could take the people who were pretty insular, those are people who only did this, and compare them with the people who also looked outside. And this is what we got, okay? The orange line is people who only looked internally. The green line is people who also looked externally. Nobody only looked externally. And look at this. Those first three things, this is actually the first thing here, results in similar cases. Where's my little arrow? Um, this is the first three things, results in similar cases, prior reputation, relationship. They still, they're the most important for everybody. But look what happens to commitment to diversity. This is a statistically significant difference, a pretty big one, actually, at the 0.01% uh, level point. Um, and this, even things like quality control systems, ethical infrastructure, these things become much more important. So let me wrap up here. What is going on? I think what we've got is a new breed of general counsel who are more metric-driven and who are more diverse than the previous generation and more diverse than the law firms that they're looking at. 
and that they're pushing in many ways a kind of new logic with law firms. Right? This is a whole subject of another talk, but they're pushing a kind of partnering model in which they want to work collaboratively with law firms, where they want to share risks as well as benefits, and they want to trust their law firms, but they want metrics to understand where that trust is coming from. And that diversity is actually one of the first metrics that they've been looking at. So, what is this going to mean? Well, you could say there's a pessimistic story, right? Which is last hired, first fired. And what's going to happen as these metrics get cranked up is that low-end work is going to disappear, that minorities are going to be the last hired, first fired, that women are going to be pressured into the 24-7 workday, which we know is very bad for diversity. And if we look at layoffs and attrition, and this is the paper that's in the book, we can see there's some evidence for this story. But you could say a different story, which is the more we have metrics, the more we can actually judge people on the basis of something other than our prior conditions. I say speed skating versus figure skating, okay? Figure skating, the East German judge, the French judge, you know, you get Katerina Witt over Debbie Thomas every time. Some of you know that, Olivia Goodell. Speed skating, you line them up on the line, and if a black kid from the south side of Chicago named Shawnee Davis crosses that line first, guess what? He wins the gold medal, right? If they're more metric driven, right? If this might overall decrease the importance of relationships, except where you can show relationships confer value, which they might be more diverse relationships might matter, and if you can create networks of value that span traditional boundaries, you might get more diversity. Stay tuned. <laughs> Frank. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much for having me here. Um, I'm here because I'm a huge fan of these two guys. Um, um, when I was asked to comment on this, I, I thought an edited book, I'm not going to want to comment on it, but I got a copy. <laughs> and um, it not only has amazing authors, so here's a, here's a problem in academic publishing. It's hard to get a publisher for an academic book and sometimes the publisher charges $117 for the book. <laughs> Look at the order forms at the back. I think that might be the number. You can get a discount, though. But um, I, because these guys founded this domain, that is the study of inequality in the legal profession, they, they could draw all the best people in sociology and law to write papers, and they didn't give them their worst papers. So what's amazing as a sociologist is uh, a bunch of these papers could be published in the, in the better sociology journals. Um, people don't usually give those papers to, a, to an edited book. So I want to say, if you don't buy the book, I don't necessarily recommend that you buy it, but read it. That's what matters. Um, because, so you, you got a picture of David's paper. And so it's the second, it's the first real paper after the introduction. So I read it in order, and I thought, okay, they put the best paper first. David, it's his book. He puts he put a real paper in. The other papers are quite amazing, and partly because they have data. And but I'll warn you, this is a very depressing book to read. And so I just, I don't want to. Let's see, I want to make sure we leave at least ten minutes uh, for your question. So let me just say a couple of things, not as critique of the book, but to, to, to talk about how much bigger a problem this is than you even realize from reading the book. And the main themes in the book are a bigger problem because they pervade not only the legal profession, they perv pervade the other liberal professions, they pervade corporate management, especially corporate management, less um, government manager management and nonprofit management. Um, and so the, the issues that are depressing in this field are depressing in all of the elite jobs. Um, so let, let me take the first, uh, the, one of the first big takeaways from, from this book, which is that um, as we heard before, the legal profession has doubled down on elite selection. That is, they are selecting more and more, not less and less, especially the big corporate law firms, 
on your credentials. So that's good news for you here, but it's not good news for people who are at Howard Law School. It's very bad news for people who are at lesser law schools. And we know that people end up at lesser law schools largely because of their class backgrounds and their race and ethnic backgrounds, not necessarily because of innate ability. I hate to say that to this crowd, but it's a fact. It's a fact. Um, so it happens here, but as we heard, um, Lauren Rivera, who's a sociologist at Kellogg, she so shows a remarkably similar pattern in investment banking and consulting to the pattern she finds in corporate law. That is, the selection process really focuses not only on Harvard and Yale, um, it focuses on the social class of applicants who come from Harvard and Yale, and whether their interests and their background match the interests and background of the recruiters. Um, so she, she's describing a process that is hardwired to select kids who went to Groton. Um, so that's one of the problems that I think is much broader than just in the law. A second problem is the, is the rise of the precariat, which I think is a nice um, term, which is basically the rise of contingent work in law or not great legal jobs. Um, so we see that in academia. We see that in the corporate world in very big ways. So for example, in academia, out, even outside of the legal uh, faculty, more than half of all teaching nationally is done by adjuncts. So those are people who get an average of $1,500 to teach a course. And those people are teaching nine courses. They do better to drive for you Uber. Right? Um, and that has gone up very sharply over the last 30 years, the proportion of classes being taught by, by adjuncts. That is the precariat. Uh, precari and it's happened also, and I think this is not so obvious to you. So think about whether you know some 55-year-old managers who are now unemployed, who used to work for big companies. If you're my age, you know a lot of people like that, because everybody, you, a lot of the people you went to college with had careers where they thought they were the organization man, the sociological term from the 50s, where you sign on to a company and you spend the rest of your career there. That model has completely disappeared. It disappeared largely in the 1990s with the downsizing movement, or the, what was then called the re-engineering movement. Companies st went from letting people go, especially middle managers, um, from letting people go because they had declining sales to letting people go because their share price dipped and they could get a very brief, brief boost in the share price by firing 10,000 people. So there was a real change in why companies fired people from we're not selling cars anymore to GM stock tanked a little bit, so we got to boost it back up. The interesting thing is the downsizing, downsizing when the econometric studies show no effect on long-term profitability. Of course, companies tend to do badly after they downsize because they can't do the work without the people who they used to have. And no long-term effect even on share price. So this was a huge mistake, but companies are still doing it every time their share price dips. So it's not that, it's, I don't think it's not that obvious to most of us because a lot of these middle managers who were downsized are, they call themselves consultants or, you know, or they're contingent workers. Um, the number of people I know like this, it's frightening. And um, so the, this was a stable elite profession. Um, so, was, so was the faculty. Um, uh, so with the professoriate. So finally, um, race and gender equity. So just as we've seen that in, in corporate law firms, um, as we heard, uh, gender equity has been stuck at the same level since about 2000, and about 17% of people are women. And minorities, um, the Hispanics and um, African Americans at about three or four percent. The same thing has happened in, in the corporate world, especially in corporate management. In fact, since the late 1980s, black and Hispanic men and black and Hispanic women in management have, have flatlined. That is, the percent of each of those groups in management has flatlined since 
1987, 1989, at levels way below the representation of the population. White women kept moving up until about 2000. They flatlined then. And we see, so what we're seeing in corporate law, we're seeing in a big way in, in corporate management generally. Um, and we're seeing it in, in academia as well. So if you look at what's happened to, to Harvard over the years, um, the underrepresented minorities in our untenured FAS faculty has gone from about 10 to 11% in the last 10 years. So that's pretty flat as well. Among the tenured, we've made some progress from about 5 to 8%, but a lot of that is from poach by poaching people from other schools because we can get people that other schools can't get. So if you look at the, if you look at the total number of African American and Hispanics in, among the tenured professoriate, it doesn't look nearly as good as we've managed to make um, our figures um, look. So I, I, I see if I want to leave 10 minutes, I have to skip ahead. Let me, let me just start off with a question or two. Um, so we see the, the, the phenomenon in the three phenomena that I, I see as central to this book in law are not specific to law. They're societal phenomena. And um, so let me ask David a question to begin with. Uh, was, I have to say, you made the story in your chapter sound a lot more optimistic than it actually is. Um, I know you're not supposed to, to depress people when you're trying to get them to buy your book, but, but here, here you've got people who you're inviting to lie to you and say, tell me that you value diversity. I'm not going to check. Tell me that you take diversity into account when you hire people. I won't look. And what do they do? They won't even lie to you about it. They won't even say diversity is, is at the top of mind or that it's among the top five things. So if you can't even get people in these positions of hiring to lie to you, I think there's a serious problem. And here's another way in which this is truly the best case scenario. The data were collected in 2006 and 2007. I don't need to tell you what happened to the law profession after 2007. So, what do these firms look like now? I mean, the people who were lying wouldn't even lie at this point, would they? So, I, I guess my question is just, what is to be done? If you're, if you're a managing partner of a, of a big corporate firm, what would you do to ch try to change the world? It, the, the whole book leaves me pretty down. <laughs> so, uh, I thought I was supposed to be the law professor here asking the tough questions. <laughs> so, look, um, you know how it is? I, I, it is depressing and sobering. And, and partly I think we did this because we really want to show a clear picture of, of where we are. And you're right to say that 2008, 2009, when the world went off the cliff, that the initial results were very bad for diversity. And there is the, uh, a wonder that chapter about when law firms blow up. And the law firms, mostly they're looking at the ones that blew up in the financial crisis. That what happened was what I said about the last hired, first fired phenomenon. And then unable to get new jobs being picked up uh, at other places. Uh, so there was, it is absolutely a stark story. So here's maybe a more uh, optimistic way to think about what's happened though since. The, the problem is now that the legal profession in general is facing a talent crisis. So, and it's a crisis of a number of different dimensions. One is just the changing demographics of law students. Look around this room, right? There's a huge mismatch between the demographics of law students and the demographics of people who are succeeding inside these law firms, particularly after the entry level. This is particularly true with respect to gender. So law is becoming what sociologists like you would call a feminized profession meaning the majority of entrants are women, and in most of the world, it's the overwhelming majority of women, like 60 or 70 percent. 
Yet the career path is made for not just a man, but a man who has a job, who has a wife who doesn't work. And there are just very few of those. And so partly what's happening, if you're a manager of a law firm, you're looking at a looming demographic <coughs> crisis. You used to just lose the women who you thought couldn't cut it, they weren't willing to work hard enough. Now, some of your best superstars in the middle associate ranks are women, or in the junior partner ranks are women, and you're losing them. Add to that the fact that applications to law school are down, that uh, those applications are down pretty much across the board, but where's really being down is the, the people in the top presumptive talent pool. That is, I'm looking at Carol, she knows this all too well, we talk about this, that if you look at the top LSAT takers, if you take this as a measure of quality, are choosing not to apply to law school, even though they've gotten the highest scores on the LSAT, which at least would mean they would get into a good law school and they would actually be on the front end of the credentialism. Why? Because what they see is less and less appealing to them, particularly in this very sector we're talking about. So, what's hopeful about that? They have to figure out how to deal with this crisis and that they've got to figure out how to deal with a talent pool that's actually much more diverse, that is throwing away 50 or 60 or 70 percent of it, which is what you'd have to throw away if you throw away the women and the minorities, becomes a much less viable solution in an increasingly globally competitive market. That's the hope. How you manage it is by recognizing that what we've done in the past has hit a seal, right? And that means thinking seriously about how the institution works and how to intervene in those normal institutional processes in a way that will improve diversity, but overall will improve the quality and the functioning of the organization, generally. And that's the hope. I mean, I can talk more about that, but that's the hope. But why don't we take a couple of questions? Yeah. Please, uh, Carol, please, since I've called you out here already, here, there's a microphone coming. Thank you. And thanks for coming, Carol. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy to be here. This is fascinating. You didn't quite call on me, but I'm taking this invitation. <laughs> I was kind of intrigued by that figure about women, about the, how the, the corporate firms that have a substantial number of women among their top um, uh, officers were much more likely to say that they were committed to diversity. And so I'm just thinking about that and trying to unravel it. So is it because and do you know whether it is because women are more committed to diversity and they're more likely to push their firms to talk this talk? They may be walk the walk, but we don't know. But, or is it because the firms that have managed to retain and promote women more are more nimble in these ways that you're describing toward reorganizing themselves more generally around a diverse workforce? And whether you have some way of explaining that dramatic differential. So Bob, do you want to take a first crack at that? Because you've done a lot of work on, Bob has got a whole other fantastic project on gender. Well, I think there, there are, uh, some of the research does show that both the presence of women and minorities on corporate boards or in general counsel's position leads to higher partnership rates for women and minorities in the firms that uh, provide services to those organizations. Now. Which part of the narrative is that? I mean, I, I think I think what that suggests is that women uh, are looking for talent, you know, regardless of um, you know the the demographics of the, the providers, and so they and I, I've heard just just informally from talking to uh, women general counsel their concerns about residual uh, sexism uh, in law firms in the corporate suites. That they see that as you know, not just a barrier, but also a limitation on the quality of work that can be provided by a larger group of people. And so, um, is it there, there's some kind of affinity there uh, between women who are in those positions and the, the kind of labor they try and uh, and tap? But I, I don't think it's just uh, essentialized. You know, the the women in general have a different attitude about these issues. So, so I think it's a, both a push and a pull. I mean, and, and uh, 
It's also, I think, the case that the organizations where women have succeeded have paid more attention in general to say how they organize themselves, not just for gender, but in terms of really focusing around around professional development, human resources. You know, there's a huge variation in organizations around how much they actually pay attention to that. The other thing is the kind of what we used to call the role modeling argument, that if you are looking at a very difficult, increasingly difficult slog to becoming a partner, you say to yourself, but if I become a partner, will I become a successful partner? And being a successful partner means what's my ability to generate clients? And as the other paper in the, uh, which is a really interesting paper, uh, which is, uh, this was a thesis I had a long time ago, but they really proved it that, you know, that inheritance idea where the client is passed down, or that women and minorities are mostly left out of that inheritance package. And therefore, they were looking ahead to see, can I make my own uh, clients? And then who am I more likely to be able to make clients with? And at least initially, a connection around a shared identity is one way to think about building that business. So, so I think it's a kind of a push-pull. It's hard to disentangle. But I think the, the intuition that if there's more diversity at the top, you're going to see more opportunity in other ranks of the organization. I think that's at least one good piece. Yeah, Aminu. Uh, thanks. It's coming around. Uh, oh, thanks, Carol. <laughs> Thank you. Um, congratulations, David. I have a copy of the book. I haven't read the whole book, but I look <laughs> at the table of content. I think it looks uh, very uh, uh, interesting, and I look forward to reading it despite the warning that uh, <laughs> I may get uh, depressed. Um, my question is related to another project that you are interested in and its connection with the findings uh, of this book, which is globalization. Uh, the US law firms are expanding, they are having clients that are more not like them, that they are different all over the world. That is the international dimension of it. Is that a factor in terms of the, the composition of the law firms here? Does it push for diversity? And, and, um, uh, and then looking at the other chapters that talk about other countries, particularly UK, uh, we know that other professions possibly provide insight for the legal profession. But does other countries also uh, provide maybe insight or, or guidance or light for good discussion here in the US? Thank you. So it's a, it's a really important question, and, and again, it's a world in which there's a kind of a mixed bag. So on the one hand, sometimes people think globalization and diversity are synonymous, and you see people say, well, most of the world is not white, and therefore everybody's going to have to become more diverse. But they're not the same thing, right? And actually, we know sometimes globalization can produce more homogeneity. We also know that the kind of diversity that globalization produces may not be the same kind of diversity when we're talking about the opportunities for women and minorities here in the United States. Women may have a more difficult time, quite frankly, in some legal markets where people are less used to seeing women. Uh, and you know, sometimes law firms think diversity means Spanish lawyers working in our Spanish office as Hispanics, which actually in a diversity study they were counted as, which I always say a Spanish lawyer that's working in Spain, last time I checked, is not a minority in Spain. Um, on the other hand, uh, there are connections around the diasporas around communities, right? So we have seen, for example, South Asians here first 1.5 generation Indian Americans, people from Nigeria who are coming here for legal education or their parents came here, born here, but have connections around the world. This is something I think that has potential and quite frankly, I urge all my students to really take advantage of the fact that it's a world like this. The, the other way is there's some evidence that if you grew up in, let's call it, a group that is not at the center but is more at the margins, whether that, and sometimes that could be being a woman, it could be being a black person, a Latino, an Asian in the United States. 
you're more comfortable in operating in an environment in which you have to reach out to other people and you have to build some consensus around understanding and listening to other people. And we've got some anecdotal evidence around this. It's hard to get very good hard evidence about it. But that we hear things said that people find more that, you know, uh, that women lawyers or minority lawyers are more likely to listen to clients who come from outside of the United States and be more culturally sensitive and aware. And that turns out to be an advantage in international law, in international business. The, the last piece I'd say is we can learn from some other countries about what they're doing around issues around gender. So in my project on India, you know, Shweta Balakrishnan, who is here, has been writing about how in Indian law firms there's actually more women in top positions and partnership positions than there are in US law firms. And maybe there's something that we can learn around that as well. I believe that runs out the clock. I think it runs out Thank the clock, but we're all here if people have more questions. Thank you.